So you just built your first deep neural network that was able to classify images. That's a huge step in the right direction, but let's see where there's still room for some improvement. Well, first off, you may not be always dealing with a 28 by 28 pixel grayscale square image. Here you can see a real photo taken of a person also wearing a t-shirt. This is probably more representative of a real world situation than the image on the left, in which you want to recognize the presence of a t-shirt on a real person. Next up, you can clearly see the lady in this image is not in the center of the image. Of course, you've seen in earlier chapters how you could use existing models to find the human and crop them out, but what if it wasn't a human you were looking for and a model did not already exist to find that thing? Maybe it's a car, a handbag, or a plate of food, and they're not in the center in the shot. Now, from your understanding of how a multi-layer perceptron samples all the pixels in the input image and adjusts its weights accordingly when training, you can probably appreciate it will associate certain features with specific locations in the image. This is fine when all the images you are classifying are resized, cropped, and centered, but this is not typically how data will be presented. Take an example from the MNIST dataset on the left. It's quite clear to you and I that the image on the right is exactly the same three, just a bit smaller and in the top right of the image instead of the center. However, to your multi-layer perceptron, this is something it's never seen before, and it will most likely classify this incorrectly if you have to try and run this through the network. Again, here the image is rotated, ever so slightly, and to us it's clear this is a number three at an angle. However, your current code from the previous section, in some cases at least, would still misclassify this too, as there's no training data like this in the dataset that it saw. So how can you create a machine learning model that can work with larger images efficiently, whereby the object might not always be in exactly the same location, or even slightly rotated or scaled? Well, thankfully, new research has come out that is very well suited for this task, known as convolutional neural networks. These use some special new layers that you've not seen before, but are then fed into what is essentially a multi-layer perception at the very end to perform the final classification. So it actually builds upon the knowledge you already know. For now, however, let's just treat the CNN as this magic gray box until we dive deeper to break it apart. At its essence, a CNN is essentially learning patterns of patterns. The first layers in these machine learning networks look for simple features in the image presented, maybe things like lines at certain orientations, which deeper layers can then use to find shapes, and those shapes can then be used to find objects. Essentially, the deeper you go into the network, the more complex of representations it can find. Here you can see an attempt from Google AI research for visualizing the different layers of a very complex and deep CNN on this slide. But you can see how each layer recognizes high level features the deeper into the network you go from left to right in this case. Now, this is all very exciting, but first let's introduce some new concepts so you can break down this gray box that currently seems rather magical. Okay, to explain these concepts, I'll be using a seven by seven pixel image like the one shown here as input data to keep things simple to understand. But remember, the principles could apply to larger images, say 256 by 256 and so on. Now remember, each pixel is just a number. Let's say white is one and black is zero. In this case, the numbers on the slide are essentially what the computer sees. If you overlay these two images that I made to see what crossover there actually is for the white pixels, you can see there is none. As far as the computer is concerned, these are entirely different images. CNNs, however, try to match pieces of the image instead of the whole image itself. Here, you can see some common features in the digits drawn. In these highlighted two by two orange squares, you can actually see the content is exactly the same. And what about these green squares? They also match. And finally, how about these pink squares? Maybe if an image has three features in a similar relative positioning that are not too far away from each other, maybe you could call that a seven. So now the question is, how do you find these features that matter? Let's talk about filters. So convolutional neural networks will use filters or some ML folk prefer the word kernels to extract the most important features from the image training data. You can think of these as tiny images, maybe three by three pixels in size, like the ones shown here. However, these are not actually images, as they can also have values like minus one, for example, as shown. Filter one here is interested in parts of chunky diagonal lines, and filter two is interested in parts of lines that are horizontal. 
you can see how they essentially overlap with the different parts of the image that match the ones in the filter. And just like the weights in the neural networks that you already learnt about, the values of the numbers in these filters are just random to start, but will be adapted over time through training to change their values to find filters that can find the best features that describe the objects in the image. Also, as an aside, if any of you are familiar with traditional image processing, you may have heard of a filter called the Sobel Edge Filter Detection. And this is basically the same sort of filtering going on here, except in this case, the computer learns the values to use rather than a human defining the pattern in advance. Now that you've got some filters, you can take each one and overlay it with every pixel and its surrounding pixels in the given image, one by one that matches the size of the filter. In this illustration, you're overlaying it to be centered on the highlighted green pixel as shown in the right image. Next, you multiply each of these nine pixels in this case by the corresponding value in the filter in the same position. In this case, taking the top left pixel as an example that has the value of zero, the same position in the filter has a value of one. So one times zero is zero, which gives you your top left result value as you see on the right. You then repeat this for all the other values in the filter to get the overall result that's shown on the right hand side. Next, you can sum up the results numbers, which in this case would be minus two as minus one plus minus one equals minus two, and all the other values are zero. Seems like this filter does not approve of this patch of the image, which makes sense as it's not over a diagonal line. So skipping ahead to a different part of the image, let's repeat the maths again. In this case, the sum of the resulting numbers would be three as there are three ones and the rest are zero. Looks like you've got a much better match than before. Now you could do this for every pixel in the image. However, you may struggle with the ones at the very edge as filter on the edge pixels would not have any pixel values to multiply with outside of the edge of the image. So what do you do in those cases? Well, when dealing with CNNs, there's a term called padding that allows you to specify what numbers to fill these out of bounds imaginary pixels with for the purpose of convolution. Here, the padding is set to zero. So it just fills in the space with this value. Alternatively, you could only sample pixels from inside the image that have enough data around them. The choice is up to you. So then, after you've applied the filter to every pixel in the image, the numbers on the left would be the outputs. Here, I've highlighted in green numbers that are above zero, with a darker green showing higher numbers, and in a similar fashion, negative numbers are in red, with darker red being more negative. You can see that your diagonal filter has led to a new matrix where the edges of the diagonal lines are quite clearly highlighted by the darker green regions. And in a similar fashion, if you perform a convolution using the other filter you just defined, the one looking for horizontal lines, you can clearly see how it's able to pick out the top of the seven in this case instead. Now that's pretty powerful stuff. Let's see how the same convolutions deal with the smaller sevens that you also had. Using the first filter on this new image, you can see it's still able to find the diagonal on the smaller seven in a different position. Good so far. And once again, for the horizontal line filter, it managed to find this part of the smaller seven too. Okay, seems like you now have a chance of finding features no matter where they are in the image. So what's next? Well, the next concept to understand is something known as stride. This just means how many pixels you'll move by when performing the convolution. Let's say we start by analyzing the current green pixel shown on the right. With a stride of one, you'd now move one pixel to the right and so on for the rest of the image, adding padding where it's needed to calculate the edge pixels and then move to the next row and continue. And in a similar fashion, a stride of two would just move the filter two spaces at a time instead. Starting as before on row two, you now move two pixels to the right and now you move two rows down and notice how with a stride of two, it means you skip a row of pixels as the stride acts in both axes. However, as this is a three by three filter, it still samples numbers from this row as shown. Great, so at this point, the only thing left to decide is how many filters do you want in your system and what size will they be? These are some new hyperparameters for you to decide what to set when you start coding later, just like you had to pick the number of neurons in prior coding. So to bring this all together then, a convolutional layer in TensorFlow.js is just a stack of trainable filters that you're applying to some image-like data, whereby the relative positions of that data actually matter in order to classify something. Also note, 
but I've used 2D data here to keep things easy to understand. But remember, three-dimensional data might exist, so you can also have 3D convolutions that act in the same way but sample data from more dimensions too. And it turns out that if you have many convolutional layers, each layer can learn more and more complex features from the ones found in the layer before it, essentially learning patterns of patterns. But if you have a large image, that's a huge amount of processing to do between every layer. Well, there's one more layer type you can use to reduce the image size after a convolution has been performed while retaining the key features it's found known as max pooling. So in a similar way to convolution, max pooling will work its way through the convolution output data with a certain size and stride. Here you see that with a size of two by two, a stride of two and using padding, max pooling would sample 16 positions in this convolution's result. Now all the max pooling is going to do is sample the numbers and find the maximum value from those numbers and record it. So the output of a max pooling layer would be smaller than the original input while still retaining the important information that matters. You can see here how for a given sampling of numbers, it lets the highest number only pass through in the final result on the right. Now, if I remove all the colored squares so it's easier to see the original data, you can see that the max pool kept all the important information that the filter found, like the horizontal line data towards the top of the image. And on that note, even though it's smaller, the important features of that filter came through no matter where they were in the image. And you can now work with a layer that's much smaller in size, greatly reducing the complexity of the model versus if you didn't do this while still having a chance of finding the object even if its position has shifted from where you saw it in the original training data. And of course, if you have many filters, the max pooling would apply itself to the output of each convolutional filter's result, so you would have a stack of max pooling results too, as shown, with each one suitable at recognizing a different interesting feature. And these steps of convolution and max pooling can be chained together to be repeated several times, creating a deeper network capable of learning more complex features. So to bring all of your knowledge together then, let's build a full diagram of a convolutional neural network with some realistic choices for the number of elements in each section. Here, you've got a 28 by 28 pixel input image like you've seen before. This has been followed by a convolutional layer containing 16 convolutions that use filters that are five by five pixels in size and produce a 28 by 28 pixel shape output as padding is used. This is then fed into a max pooling layer that uses a two by two max pooling size with a stride of two, which produces 16 feature maps that are now 14 by 14 in size instead. Essentially, it's made the convolutional results a quarter of the original size while retaining the key information from the 16 convolutions. You can then feed the results of the max pool into a second convolutional layer, this time using 32 five by five filters, producing a 14 by 14 output as it's sampling the max pool outputs that are already 14 by 14 in size. This convolutional layer's results are then fed into a second max pooling layer, again with a two by two size max pool with stride of two, producing 32 feature maps that are now just seven by seven pixels in size. And then finally, these 32 feature maps from the second max pool can be flattened into one huge array of numbers, which are then fed into a regular multi-layer perceptron that you already used before. In this case, this perceptron has 128 neurons in the first layer and then 10 neurons in the output layer, representing each of the 10 digits it can classify, just like you learned in the previous sections. And as before, the highest number on the output represents the prediction of what it thinks it saw in the input image. In this example, it shows a seven has been classified. Now, so far, you've been learning about using CNNs with the context of image data. However, CNNs can be used for any data that is image-like in nature, meaning that the spatial position of a data is important in order to classify the contents within it. For example, a database table of customer addresses is not suitable for a CNN because if you change the order of the rows of data, they would still make sense. In contrast, if you change the rows of an image of a dog, you'd no longer have an image of a dog. The order of the pixels matters for image data. Also remember that data could be 2D-like images or 3D for other types of sensor. And one good example of other data that could be represented as an image is sound. 
it turns out you can draw recorded audio as a spectrogram like the one shown here, which is an image showing the frequencies of sound heard over time. Well, guess what? Your CNN will work just fine on these too, and now you've got the ability to classify short audio clips as well. Pretty cool. Okay, that was a lot to digest. So in the next section, we'll put all of this into action and code a CNN that can recognize images more robustly. See you there.